ahead, Dan, if you want to just start us off with introducing yourself and we'll just kind of pop one out introducing everybody. Sure. Yeah. Welcome once again, everyone. Uh, my name is Dan Campbell, uh, technologist at the e-learning department. Hi, my name is Hikaru Murata, School of Education, Physical Education, Health and Physical Education Coordinator. Yeah, it must be a challenging environment for you right now with all the different rules then. Yeah, I'm Tracy Russo, Senior Online Designer here at Ferris and at work at eLearning. I'm Andrew Tingley. I'm in the Television and Media, and Media Production Department. I'm Kelly Sinkowski. I'm also uh, online designer in e-learning. Hi all, I'm Ann Brighton with your research and instruction from um, Information Access Discovery Library. Hi everybody, uh, my name is Andrew Wiltshire. I'm faculty in mechanical engineering technology. Hi, I'm Leslie Sukup, and I am a professor in the management department within the College of Business. Uh, and I'm Julie Rowan, and I work in the Faculty Center for Teaching and Learning. Great. So we've got a wide spectrum today, so it ought to be some really good conversations about how to go about connecting our classrooms with some of these different areas. I am going to go ahead and share my screen, and do feel free at any time to interrupt me, popcorn out, an idea, suggestion. I will be stopping for you know questions and feedback and things that you may have done that you want to offer the group. You can also feel free at any time again to use the chat. Um, you know, I encourage that type of interaction. You know, at no point in time does this belong to me where no one there's anything sacred. This is a you know for faculty by all of us together to improve teaching. So I look forward to everybody's contributions to make this work and to, again just bring another good semester here to everyone at Ferris. So I'm going to share my screen. And find the right tab. Okay. And this is some of you, um, I don't think anyone has been to any of our other ones. So this is actually the third session in a series that we're recording about launching your successful semester. And so there is a lot, you know, in this, all these recordings, as Dan said, they will be available both individually and then we have them all in a playlist. So if you were not able to come to any, you should be able to view all the playlists as well as get the you know, the PowerPoints in isolation. The, in all the PowerPoints, any of the links, we're making sure that by the time we share it out publicly, all the links are there. So anything we talk about or mention, you should be able to access later. So, you know, again, in the online environment, you don't also have to try and figure out on taking notes. Does everyone see the slide launching your successful semester? Okay, wonderful. And today's focus, you know, is the connected classroom. Julie mentioned that she really liked our sustainable ecosystem graphic that I had selected this summer when her and I did a workshop together. Um, in each of these sessions, I've kind of chosen a metaphor to just frame our thinking because I find that very helpful when we're trying to look at a holistic picture of our teaching. And so in this one, I actually took the idea of the ecosystem and put it in a tapestry because one of the things with creating a connected classroom is that um, relationship between you know every individual part in it in order for the whole to be effective and to thrive and to be sustainable each individual piece needs not only to be included but also connected in a way that it cannot be pulled out or separated or isolated from the whole so for those of you who were not here in the last two yesterday we talked about um, different ways to communicate with our classroom and to set it up and the metaphor was the maze. And then in the first one where we were talking about the considerations um, of the classroom, the metaphor, you know, as far as what you need to prepare ahead of time, the metaphor was getting on a ship and making sure you have everything ahead of time. So in today's session, we're going to just talk about ways to create a connected classroom environment with interactive assignments, technology integration, student integration, or student engagement and embracing online assignments. 
and we're going to do this. I have some examples to share, some things to think about, and then a lot of it will be, you know, sharing some discussion and other ideas. So any questions before I move on? You can absolutely just popcorn out anything. So I really wanted to start with talking about the importance and why, and I don't wanna spend a ton of time, but I just wanted to hear from everybody. And again, whether you choose to put something in the chat or if you choose to just popcorn out, let's just look at a face-to-face -face classroom. And this is just a random classroom through the you know, royalty-free Google search that I picked. But what do we see in this classroom with connections as well as boundaries? What kind of connections might you observe here or what kind of boundaries? The uh, first thing I noticed, Tracy, is everybody's facing the same direction. Uh, which could serve to uh, limit the students' abilities to interact with each other. Yeah, I have to agree with him. Well, it looks like it's uh, passive learning. Looks like. There's a, building off Dan's comments, there's a front of the room which can you know, a boundary or a power demarcation, perhaps. Yeah, interestingly, I tried to find a picture that had more of a group setting, but I couldn't find one um, without spending way too much time on that. So that's interesting that two of you picked up on, you know, that more passive learning style with this, but but even so, you know, with passive learning, some of the things with the connections, so you're right, in this, one would assume that the connection between instructor and students is probably the one being most promoted. But you can also look and see, one of the things that I observed when I was looking at this image was that the tables were in pairs, so it's implied to me that they might do some partner work at other times. And I like how Dan said they're all facing in the same direction, which in one sense can be a negative in terms of you know, potentially being more passive, but on the other hand, it can be potentially a benefit because when we're thinking about other types of learning, you know, it's really important for students to know what direction they're going in in order to get to the end successfully. One of the boundaries that the physical classroom has, which may seem very minimal, but in reality, it can be a big boundary, again, for good or for bad, depending on how it's used, but it is in a classroom. So the number of interactions that people are doing or need to worry about at that moment in time, it is limited to the people in their sphere of influence, which kind of relates back to when we were talking about kids and dogs. You know, that's something that in face-to-face, -face, it's easier to be more focused on your learning because these other aspects are removed. Sorry, trying to find my... I moved my cursor off screen there. So when we look at an online student, same questions. What connections do you observe? What boundaries? What might this have to do with learning? She seems focused on her laptop, which may imply that she's actually listening or at least focused on the class. She could also be looking at Facebook at the same time. So unless she has her camera on, the instructor might not know if she's, you know, giving some kind of attention. In the same light, I guess her cell phone sitting next to her mm -hmm. could go off at any moment.
piggybacking on the last thing you said, Tracy, it does look like she might be in a room by herself uh, with with minimal other distractions. So that could be a good thing. Anything else about how this might be, you know, a good or bad, as far as helpful boundaries or helpful connections or hurtful boundaries or hurtful connections? I see what looks like a wired internet connection, which, which is always nice to see. No sketchy Wi-Fi. Yeah, it's interesting because, you know, if you, if we go back to the slide before and we look at this classroom, if we think about a student who might not have observed or heard what a, the faculty member said, you know, they can look and there's, you know, there's a screen, so hopefully they can see notes or they could look at their partner or someone around them or ask somebody around them. So there's a lot of other connections. And when we look at this, it's, I'm glad that Dan did point out the cords because I wondered if anybody would notice that because it is all of a sudden we're connected by a cord. That's really the only physical connection at this time that we know. Um, as I think it was, I'm sorry, I'm going to, I'm probably going to pronounce it wrong. Haikuro um, mentioned about, um, I think it was you in the beginning, that she um, may or may not be paying attention because she's looking at it. Um, so Dan brought up that it could be a good thing that she's alone in the room, but based on what you've been hearing and seeing in the last you know, nine, 10 months since the COVID shift, is being alone in a room a good thing for most people? I would have said yes, but the way you framed the question, I'm guessing no. I mean, it kind of determines, it's based on the level of her ability to focus. I mean, what, what is it said that some people can even be reading material out of a book for only about 20 minutes before their mind can start to wander. And then there needs to be some kind of a, a break. And then you come back and you refocus. And I think that part about the amount of time, that's the critical piece. You know, anything in the world can be good or bad depending on the amount, but when we're looking at being alone or just being connected in her posture staring at the computer, for a certain amount of times for focus, that's awesome. You know, research does show that the multitasking, although people may say that it's effective and they can do it, the studies are not showing that it's really truly bearing out the way that they're saying. And at the same time, too much being alone can also be a problem. So that's where some of the design comes in that we'll be talking about. But when we have that totally disconnected classroom, if the only thing the students have or the only thing a faculty member has, because this affects both of us, if, you know, it, it doesn't matter what level you are, whether you're faculty, staff, admin, or a student, in a disconnected classroom, what are some of the things that we've been seeing or hearing happen? Yeah. You want, you can just use, use a reaction or raise your hand, how many, or popcorn out, how many people have heard stories about people ghosting? I think I've heard that as well with um, <clears throat> faculty I talked to where their students disconnect. Mm -hmm. um, but like you were saying in the last slide, if they're sitting in a room by themselves all the time, if they're working by themselves, without interaction, then I think that you can get very disconnected. But if they have some kind of interactions happening with other students or group projects, I think then they won't feel so disconnected. But if not, then it's, it can be a problem. <laughs> yeah, the ghosting or the disappearing in every session Dan and I have done this week, and I think this is session five, we've had people talk about what do I do when it starts out great, and everybody's showing up and then partway down the road, all of a sudden I don't get as good attendance or I'm talking to lawyers and they're not, I don't know if they're there. And that is a real phenomenon of, um, you know, lack of interaction and again, the disconnection that people feel where they're not feeling able to, you know, be as connected. 
The image on the right I chose because statistically prior to this, the National Alliance for Mental Health Institute, um, prior to this, the statistic was something around 25% of all college students were reported suffering from, you know, a mental, they, during their time of college, they had some type of experience with, you know, mental illness or depression, anxiety, and those types of things. But some of the stats since COVID has hit from the same organization have come out where now it's 25% of our college students have considered suicide. I mean, that's phenomenal. And that right there, I think to me speaks to this need that we have to make sure that we're designing education and our classes in a way, because on top of that, it connects us as well. The research shows, you know, faculty also do better when they are connected to their students. So let's just take another minute. What did everyone experience this year in either being connected or disconnected or how it felt? And again, positive or negative or neutral, in this group, what was your collective experience? At first I had a lot of people, you know, who had their cameras on and then it started to slowly drift off and then I made it mandatory to have their cameras on. But even with their microphones off, I just felt almost completely disconnected. Like I was talking to a wall, you know, and I know that can happen in real life too, but definitely, definitely felt that way talking to a computer screen full of almost <laughs> blank, almost blank faces sometimes. And along those lines, I did a mix of, of synchronous and asynchronous, depending on sizes. You know, I had one combined sections of over 100 students, and it's almost impossible to do synchronous. But in that case, you, you also miss out on, on uh, the interaction, even with scheduled you know, office times or anything like that. It's, I, the thing that I mentioned is I don't feel like I really have a grasp of any of my students from the fall really there to put a face with a name and that's something I've really struggled with um, moving forward. Anyone else like to chime in on something either similar or different that they experienced? I experienced a lot of the same that you have a little bit more disconnectedness with the, your students because many of them don't they don't want to put on their camera and then I had quite a few who had poor internet connections so even just doing some of the the group work in the small breakout sessions that we would have was was hard because they couldn't fully participate so that that was that was a challenge but one of the the ways that I helped with connectedness, at least some, was using Flipgrid. And I, I found that the students enjoyed that, but then it, again, you still have those that still have the, the internet problems, the bad connections. Caro, you are muted. Can you unmute yourself to speak? Oh, I'm sorry. That's my bad. I, yeah. I, was, I had very similar experiences and uh, I was constantly wondering what they are doing and the uh, connection was bad and all, all this kind of stuff. I have to constantly ask myself if they're studying, uh, they, they're following me or you know, that's that constantly wondering what's what they are doing. So relatively negative experiences. And I think across the board, you know, that's what we've heard in higher ed as well as K-12. I mean, that's kind of, again, it's been a completely different experience for most people. The people who had very little disruption were the people who were already teaching online prior who had designed their classes specifically for online with students who also chose to be online students because again that's a completely different ball of wax than what the pandemic because you know just as many faculty do not enjoy the online teaching experience but it's all you're doing a lot of students also did not the um the staring at the screen that was mentioned i think in maybe in the beginning um 
that is not only is it, you know, we've heard so much about Zoom fatigue, but even for learning, you know, there's a lot of work with the self-efficacy and mastery and the connections that with the um, constructivist type learning, a lot of it, we do learn from the people around us. So it's not even just staring smaller at a screen that biologically raises our stress level. It makes us feel smaller and less connected and less important. But we're also missing out on that vicarious learning from the other people around us, which research shows that accounts for about 25% of learning. So it's a lot that you know we're just missing out on across the board because it isn't the same. You're only seeing people in a little square. So fortunately, there are things we can do differently. And part of it just involves kind of some different ways of thinking about online learning. And some of it is thinking of replacing not the exact activity that we did when we were fully online, but replacing the type of function and the type of connection that it had. So this is a slide from Julie and I, one of our presentations this summer and looking at how do we create these connections, thinking back to that ecosystem metaphor and the tapestry of weaving everything together so that it's not just you know, a connection between the student and the laptop with the squares, you know, the little Zoom squares or the team squares, and the same thing for faculty with squares. It's looking at the five different types of interactions. So creating in the interactions with instructor, self, peers, world, and content. So for some of this, I'm gonna kind of um, go quickly because I think most people are very familiar with the types of interaction, for example, between student and content. I mean, that's something as faculty in higher ed, most people are fairly confident with, you know, the students can learn from the books, from the web, from different things. But it's these other aspects that embracing that, so when we're all in this, you know, pandemic, less physically connected world, honing in on ways that we can use these to create connections. So when Kelly and I in particular work with people on the CDA process, one of the things that we have them do is look at their current course. You know, what does a week look like? Who are, you know, what are all the different types of connections that the students are having and that you're having? And we have them literally go through and think about, you know, each day of the week and they map this out on an Excel spreadsheet to see, you know, all those different interactions because if we're going to have a connected classroom online, you know, making sure that those interactions reflect, you know, enough solidity so that, you know, each day, it's not just the students staring at a computer or staring at the book or you, you lecturing at a bunch of screen, it's, you know, a variety, having them talk to other people, being in other activities. And so that's where I wanted to bring up students with the world. So this is, the, probably the biggest thing that we can do at this point in time when we are looking at building interactions to create a connected classroom. One of the ways is connecting them with the world. Does anyone have any different things that they um, have done where, because we're limited now with the computer screen, but yet our students could be anywhere and we are using the computer. So does anyone have any examples of ideas that they have used where they have connected their students to the world around them to enrich or exchange their different types of learning. The photo there, Tracy, actually reminds me of an assignment I had in Boston uh, when I was there for my doctoral program. We had to go out into the city and take photos of um, examples of communication we could find that are just kind of hidden in plain sight. Um, one good example is around the outer perimeter of uh, the campus of Northeastern, uh, the sidewalk is a different color. Uh, so you know that if you cross it, you are on campus. That's um, cool. Yeah, really cool assignment. Uh, What other things have uh, folks uh, come across? I know one of the assignments that one of my pre-service teachers when I was at GVSU created is a physical, um, 
physical education experience and they had their students, they had to go outside. Again, it goes back to using the cell phones because um, I think 99% of society at this point in time in our age range, when we're looking at 16 and up minimum, um, has a cell phone. And so the assignment was they had to create a fitness plan or a fitness, you know, like a fitness path, they could do it for whatever grade level and community, but using things in the community. So they, some of them chose to map, you know, like the different walking routes. Other ones mapped parks where they had exercise equipment and things like that. And then they put it together. And this was, I don't know, four years ago, but they put it together in, it was a presentation that was hosted online. So then anybody could click on the dot on the map and find, oh, I wanna go get fit in this area and they would find different ways that they could access, you know, different fitness options. So that's one of the ways, you know, using the cell phones that I have seen, like, you know, with um, Hikaru's physical education. Other ideas that maybe even you personally have either experienced, like Dan shared one that he had experienced, or other ways that maybe in your discipline you can think of that you could put in a discussion forum where students could go search out something and bring it back. I can add in here um, while people are thinking about it. When I work with faculty, we talk through a lot of the different ways that they could liven up their courses and their discussion board posts. And Tracy and I have talked about this quite a bit as well, of taking your camera and your, your phone, <laughs> camera, your device, and taking pictures of things where, whether you just walk around outside and you link that somehow to your content, um, but a lot of the things that they do too is look up something online and take a screenshot of that, post it. It could be a picture, it could be a video snippet um, from a movie. It could be anything like that where you're relating it back to the content, but it's, it's um, learning outside of your course content. So anything where they can apply what they're learning, whether it's a relevancy piece and they go find a job posting anywhere on the internet or whatever skill they're going to learn in your course so that they see it as a relevant piece that it that's something an employer will look for later whether it's a scenario or a news story that involved your content just anything where they can um, post a link to a video or a screenshot of something that they can put in a discussion board and then learn from each other and then bounce off posting um, responses to each other so I've seen a lot of that and I really like how Kelly brought in the discussion board because that's what I wanted to bring in. Part of this, one of the easiest ways to do this type of activity in your classroom is through just simple discussion board use. Discussion board students are familiar with doing them from if they use Blackboard, but even in K-12, even before COVID, many K-12s were using discussions in various formats. And so the concept of discussing is, again, it's not new, so it's you know, one of those easy things to implement where you can add a discussion forum and with the directions where you're having them go seek out something, you know, again, whether they're seeking something on the web or they're seeking something in their environment, all of a sudden you've done, going back to the connected classroom, you've connected them with their own environment. They could even interview people that are in their realm of influence. So you've got all of a sudden they can connect with people, events, you know, turf samples, and architecture, films, and a million different things. But when they post that live stuff back in the discussion board, and then you have them compare, contrast, you know, there's so many higher ed thinking skills you could, you know, throw in with that with just the basic gen ed skills. Now they're connected with each other around something of substance, as well as in, you know, from the teaching standpoint, if you put in that simple prompt of, you know, go find something out in say, the world and you have them use a piece of criteria or compare it to something in your content then all this and then they're discussing it so you've got them connected both to the content because you've given the criteria and to the world and to each other with something meaningful that they would not be getting if they were in that classroom that picture in the front where they're all looking at the instructor so now all of a sudden you don't have to be the one even creating all these connections you just have to ask a good question in the discussion board 
So those are, you know, especially even the interviews is one of the ways because people can interview now because everybody's online and things have moved virtually, there are free resources everywhere, you know, if they just search out the title. So well, I mean, oh, sorry. Go ahead. No. Oh, the earlier question about using their cell phones as a as an option. Um, I saw a lot of benefit. I, I teach the senior design project uh, for our program and rather than have them type traditional status update memos, you know, that would have been the historical way of doing it, that they can use their phone and, and do an interactive uh, just update, a status update using the phone, recording a short video. Um, and that seemed to work really well. They, they like that better than scheduling a, a few minutes to, to update me personally. And it's convenient for everybody that way. That's a great idea because, well, Canvas discussions, you can have a Canvas discussion or a Canvas assignment. Canvas allows the students to use that video feedback as well as for you. And then Leslie mentioned, um, I think it was Leslie mentioned using Flipgrid. And Flipgrid is another one that's been around for, I'm not sure how many years, but a fair amount of years, at least five or six that I'm aware that it has been mainline in K-12, where people can create um, short videos of themselves, you can create criteria and then they can react to each other's videos. So it's not the same as being there, but it's a lot more interesting than, you know, reading words on the text. And another advantage to like what Andrew was suggesting as far as their status update using video rather than words. In video, we speak, you know, the average speaking rate is somewhere in American uh, Midwest English is somewhere around 200 to 250 words per minute. When students are typing, they're typing, especially if they're on a cellular device, unless they have been in business and taking typing classes, you're looking at more like 34 words per minute. So the amount of time, just by giving a spoken recorded update, it's so much faster and so much more natural for us to do it that way. And then another piece going back to that connection with that is you get the person's personality you get, how do they sound? Do they sound upbeat? Do they sound, you know, excited about the subject? Or, you know, you get those different personality pieces that can come through as well. These are Teresa, some I want to piggyback on that. That is such a great idea because so many times if you're having a discussion board right in Canvas, whether they have a phone with cell service or their home computer with internet, they can do a quick response with the video. If you say, okay, if you research something instead of writing a paper, again, or something that you have to grade. It can be a five minute video on something they researched, um, what, how does it apply, what are the, you know, you give them the content criteria for the video. And what do you want them to talk about? And don't forget whether they're doing, you know, posting screenshots to make it relevant or their videos. Don't forget that whole why or why not. You know, you don't even have to, um, come up with all the questions like Tracy was saying. It's just kind of how does this apply? What did you find? Why, why, why not with the application? Um, but really think about doing this in place of your typical quiz or paper or something like that. So this would replace, say, chapter questions or something like that. This is them applying what they've learned instead of just kicking back and out of memory what they've learned. Um, so it's a higher order. And um, it's actually kind of fun for you then to see what they come up with. And then you can also comment in the dis discussion board if you have to redirect or maybe add in another resource that they can uh, research on their topic. Um, it definitely makes it more interesting for you as well as them. And one thing to remember about, you know, when you go to video, it's definitely more fun for you. And I'm glad that Kelly brought that up because, you know, I could see a really fun assignment would be that type of, you know, for example, the elevator speech. You know, give an elevator speech on chapters 13 and 14. And so you only have two minutes to do that. And then you can have them work in small groups even to say, okay, of those elevator speeches, which one most accurately reflects the content in those chapters? So again, so a much different aspect of rather than reading a chapter and taking notes and putting a 250 word essay in the discussion, a lot more interesting and engaging. And then Again, using things like that discussion board and thinking about the grading of that, if they're doing it individually and coming to terms, coming to consensus as a group, it's smaller, shorter grading for you, but they're still getting a lot of feedback from each other on whether or not they learned. 
so they've got that connection. Am I in? Am I getting from the chapter what my instructor wanted me to get? Because otherwise, they don't know. And another part, just one of those preventative. I did not put this on the on the um, slide, but I'm going to add that back. And I've got some other links that I'll add for some resources for this. But when you are using technology, and I'm I'm guessing that Andrew could probably speak greatly to this. If you are going to assess it, put a time limit on it or let them know you're only going to assess the first couple of minutes because that is a downside. If you don't give them a limit, sometimes students will create, I've had you know, hours of video and because they spent hours creating it, of course they want feedback, but it can be, um, you know, when you have 100 students, you're like, no, cannot do. So putting those time constraints on it. That's excellent. That's an excellent bit. Thank you for that. Yeah, yeah. I think about just like the papers, you, if you don't put a limit, say you want three to five page paper, you're going to get 25 pages that <laughs> you have to look through. So it's the same, you know, and that's a good point, Tracy, make sure you have some of those parameters for yourself as well as for them. Yeah. That's another reason why I am a proponent of using for a lot of these things, use those discussion boards. They will want to see each other's because that brings them that vicarious learning. Then they can see, well, how do other people see it? How do they understand it? Am I getting it the same way? You know, if they're not used to being, you know, doing video of any kind, you know, again, make sure it's low stakes and let them know you're not, when I used to teach, pre-service teachers, I would tell them, I'm not grading you on your graphic design skills because you're, this is not a class for graphic design. I am grading you on your ability to communicate the topic. And so, because that is a, an essential role for a classroom teacher. And so, you know, with those, start with low stakes so that they are comfortable, but they'll watch each other. And so they get that, then they do that self-assessment while they're watching, they're doing the peer assessment. And the other great thing about that is then even going back to that grading thing, because almost every single faculty member and teacher that I know is still recovering from grading fatigue from last semester. If you use it in a discussion board, another piece that I recommend when you're doing, again, creating those connections, but so then you, rather than give each person individual feedback, which takes forever if you're going to give quality feedback, go ahead and kind of sum it up in one consensus building post wow, these videos were great. I noticed that everybody pointed out the essential topics of the chapter, blah, blah, blah. I did see a weak area was in the interpretation of blank concept and you refer them to the page and maybe call out a few specific people and you give one kind of consensus. But again, in face-to-face -face class, they would only be able to talk so much. You would only be able to interpret so much and you would give them all this one piece of general feedback. So take the load off of yourself, but you're still connected because in the discussion board, they can all see it and they all can hear it. In the media, you know, bringing that media again, it's, you know, it's the best recreation of life at this time that we can have, but it's also a wonderful creative outlet. You know, if you don't believe that media can be creative, just go play on TikTok um, for starters. You know, again, it does not have to be fancy. I did want to share, um, you know, Leslie, unless she has hers ready to share, I'm going to move um, Flipgrid over. I just want to show a little bit of Flipgrid. I haven't used mine in a while, but it is a free tool. And when you, you can actually create classes and within classes, it allows you to do separate topics for your class. So you can you know, have that. So then for example, um, you know, they just did reflections. Students, they get into adding the stickers, stuff like that, silly things. You know, again, it can be fun and it's free. It provides a link, but they can all, you know, put their video and then people can respond to the video and you can actually set in criteria ahead of time for how you're going to grade it, things like that. I'm not going to share their stuff because that was, they do know that this is public. Um, that was part of the assignment, but we just don't want to take their time, but it's just a nice format for them to use that people can use. You know, it sounds like, you know, Leslie, you used it, but it might fit some other people if you wanted to use something outside of the Canvas discussion. Any other ideas about? Yeah, yeah I would like to share just, 
I found it useful and some people here may as well that if, if you're doing any sort of computer based uh, learning, not not just watching lectures and stuff online, but for example, uh, sol solid modeling in my program where students are doing designs on their computers, for them to share screen capture with me, I found that simply using studio within Canvas is, is great because it's, it's consistent. People don't think about the students using studio so much as they do as faculty recording themselves with it, but it's an excellent tool for the students to screen capture maybe walk you through a software program that they've created or a design that they've done. Um, and it turns out excellent quality and it, of course embeds so easily within Canvas. You don't have to worry about, well, for this student, I have to click a Zoom link and for another one, I've got to do Teams or who knows what else, you know, it just keeps a consistency that works well. Andrew, I'm curious, how uh, did your students find it pretty easy to learn Studio? Yeah, I, I posted a short video of myself doing one to kind of introduce it to them, but it was no problem at all. That's great to hear. Yeah, and that brings up some other great points when you're, again, using technology to connect your students through various ways and using video. Um, you know, I put up here, structure the task, not the result of the task. You know, that allows them with more creativity. But along with that, I like how Andrew said, first of all, he used a tool that he knows is on, you know, is within Canvas, so it's got consistency. Another advantage to having that, and he made a screencast, so he gave the directions on how to use that tool. But also, if they're using that tool in Canvas, if the student is using a Canvas tool, we can help them. Our department in e-learning, that's one of the things, so, you don't have to think, oh my gosh, I need to teach them how to use technology on top of everything else I have to do. Give them the task, and if it's using one of the Canvas tools, if they run into trouble, they can, first of all, go to Canvas Help, which has a phenomenal help guide, but they can also ask us for help, and we can help them troubleshoot very easily. That consistency for the students is a huge thing. And absolutely, Canvas is set up so students can use media, students can use audio feedback, and it's also um, what I call technology agnostic. So it doesn't matter if they're on an Android, it doesn't matter if they're on an Apple, it doesn't matter if it's a Mac or if it's a PC, they can all use Canvas Studio. So, you know, again, that, that takes you out of the role of technology teacher and puts you back in the role of teacher of your discipline. Any other, you know, comments or thoughts on the way that you've done things with um, using either just different tools or, again, successful c connections that you've helped students make? <coughs> I put the link to this um, online group work assignments. And I'm not going to go to this, but that'll be shared in the presentation. But I did want to bring up that the structuring online group assignments, you know, that is something with our scaffolding. That's one of the best ways, again, to create those connections. And, but at the same time, making sure that now that we're all kind of in this weird COVID where things can change on a dime, you can be told all of a sudden you're quarantined or you can be told it's shut down, just making sure that you've got more frequent low stakes due dates. You know, it used to be if they were coming to face-to-face -face class, a lot of times you didn't have anything except in your syllabus, except maybe the last due date of when it was due or maybe even a rough draft. But regardless of discipline, we encourage everybody to think of it more like a beginning English comp. So have, have your students check in by handing in, you know, and again, they can do it in a discussion board or something so it's low stakes, but making sure that they are handing in, for example, their thesis idea. Having their thesis, that's a great opportunity for having you know, that synchronous small group discussion around that, but that's an opportunity for check-in. And then maybe they have to hand in their first you know, page or two or their annotated bibliography for whatever the project is. Or maybe one of the things that I do a lot with mine is I have them hand in as their first assignment in any group project, they have to hand in their plan to plan so that I know that they have met with their group members, they know who the group members are, and they have developed a system 
that then, you know, I'm not going to get that last minute. Well, none of my group members participated and I don't know who they are and they never responded. No, we've got the plan to plan in the beginning. So then I have time and the group members have time to address situations before they come up. So that's another, you know, way with the group work, just to make sure that you are creating those connections for your students. Yeah. The last slide that I've got, I just wanted to go through because here are many, many resources and I wanted to just describe a few of them in terms of things because some of these are student facing as well. And then I'm going to open it up to some other ideas and ways that we can embrace technology and embrace, you know, what's going on to create a connected classroom for our students. Um, this engaged e-learning blog, we will be restarting posting um, by next week. And that's something you can search in categories. So you can go into that blog and there are examples of reviews of tools, there are examples of how to's, there are theoretical pieces, but you can search by the categories. So there's a category on it even for interaction. So, you know, within that you can hear a wide variety and in a lot of the blogs we try to either connect it to the research or to other faculty members so that you would know who else you could contact among the faculty who maybe has done that before. Because I find that's always very helpful even again for faculty, it's as important for you to be connected to each other as it is for the students in the class. Um, the Keep Teaching, that just has a lot of basics and a lot of different strategies. It also has in there different grouping strategies, different tools that you could use that are um, interact well with Canvas or within Canvas, how to do different things. And so it also has some, again, other faculty examples of directions. I think, um, I don't know if I've added it yes, yet, but I've got some sample courses that we're going to link in if you want to see, again, what are other faculty doing? It's, we're just like our students, we wanna know what other people are doing. So you can go to that resource. This Keep Learning is a piece for your students where you can share that with them and help them get connected. You know, the faculty guide was created in the fall, so that has just kind of a lot of ideas. Um, the first 10 slides of that are all different faculty strategies for how they've connected their students in different ways they've taught with their students. And then these are just some other pieces that are more like how-to focused. And so with that, I'm just going to, um, and you've already found us here, but I'm going to exit the screen share because I just want us to go ahead and talk about any other ways or ideas as far as how we can use Canvas or use any other tools to connect our students so that this semester is going to be, it may not be the same as spring last year. Well, actually spring last year is not a fair comparison. It may not be the way that we originally pictured our teaching was going to be, but it can be some really phenomenal teaching. It just, it's gonna be different. Other ideas or even a question for something that you used to do that you would like to do, but you don't know how to do. That's another good use of the last bit of time. We've heard a lot of great questions from faculty where they, they just don't know how to translate something to online. For me personally, the biggest struggle is uh, lab exercises, um, without a doubt. I, I've, I feel like I've become much better as an online instructor in terms of lecture, but, um, and when we have a plan for it, it's fine. But for example, in the fall, when we shut down early and you have things planned where maybe your labs are still meeting face to face and all of a sudden you cannot, you know, and that's the risk for me in the spring is that if, if we, if we get a, a mandatory, Hey, you got to stay at home. I can transition the lecture just fine, but the lab is always such a challenge. <clears throat> yeah. One of the, I think it was in nursing or informatics, um, Bottom line, they had clinical rotations that came to one of our earlier sessions. And what they did, which they said they were very glad that they did, they basically front loaded all of the most important hands-on things that they had to do so that that way they figured they would get them in while people were there. And so when we did get the shift to remote, it wasn't quite as awfully bad as, as it could have been. Yeah. And so I think that's, that's one of the things um, that all of us right now, when we simply don't have control over that part. Chris DeFreya is also someone, he is a biology faculty member here at Ferris, and he has a number of videos that he has created, and he's willing to run some workshops and do some things in how to basically 
use your laptop and your phone as a dot cam and how to basically how to teach in a lab or how to how to recreate as much as possible lab activities online. So we will be putting out some information on that, but he's another great resource on that. Yeah, I'd like to see some creative ideas. We've done some things such as, you know, the faculty actually conduct the experiment and, you know, record what's going on. So the students at least have an understanding and then have them maybe calculate with the numbers that you generated or whatever it may be. But, you know, based on SAIs and things of that nature, that's probably the strongest bit of feedback that, that myself and I think other faculty in my area have, have had. Yeah, uh, Darren, um, I think Wilson in heavy equipment, he and I have been working together on using some case study approaches and that's something, they do that in the medical field, they do that in all areas, but you, again, going back to the Canvas discussion board where if there's no other tool that you, you use, the Canvas discussion board is just one of those really good ones. Yeah. Um, and so they do it with the case study. So they do like part, so they, you record the whole entire experiment, but you edit it. So then you only post say the first part where you get to a decision of what you would need to do next. And then you ask the question and you set it up so they can't see anybody else's answer until they answer theirs. You know, mm -hmm. what do I need to do next? And then you give them the, depending on their answer, you can give them the reteaching or you can give them the great job or both. And then you get in the next bit and kind of scaffold them that way. Okay. And he's now thinking about having them create yeah. you know, their videos as well for the same thing. Kind of a side question off from that. Is there any training specifically on editing Canvas or studio video content? That America? is a great question. I know that I have done training in the past. I haven't done it recently, but that is something that um, Dan and I can add to our list of trainings to offer. And then also I can see if Chris already has some trainings made. Because yeah, I don't want to get sucked in too much. I can tell you that it's um, video. Well, actually I'll let Andrew tell you. How easy and quick is video editing? <laughs> Well, there are some free utilities, actually. The, I went to the meeting earlier that Wes and Jeff Cabalas did from Media Services, um, and, and they're offering those services, of course, to the teachers to edit so you guys can focus on your content. Um, but yeah, I mean, just, just cutting, cutting stuff down, chopping stuff in and out, you know, that's a relatively easy process if you use some free software. There's a Caden Live is a pretty easy one to use, and it's free. So. Yeah. Well, it would be beneficial as somebody yeah. that's done anything like that. I, I can't tell you how many, you know, I'm 30 minutes into a video and scrap it because I did something wrong or who knows what. But. Yeah. Does, does your program use any of uh, the Adobe Creative Cloud suite or anything like that? Uh, not really. No. Okay. Because Adobe did come out with a new program called Adobe Rush, which makes the process a lot simpler. Mm -hmm. um, so that would, that would be more for the non-editors. But again, that's a, that's a paid program. But. Yeah, the one that's free that I've used um, with, I'm going to see if I can, I don't think I can log in. Um, it's called Adobe Spark. So it's in that same Adobe product and it's a free tool. I've used it with all my pre-service teachers back when I was at GVSU. So, you know, almost 100 students a semester. And the only ones who ever had a problem, it just goes back to microphone quality, which there's not, you know, but they can, use, they can do it on their cell phone. Um, it is a free tool, and what I like about Adobe Spark is, this sounds so dumb, but if you are a non-techie who doesn't want to spend your time doing video creation and editing, but at the same time, you'd like some features, you want it to be, um, you know, short, sweet, succinct, to the point. Each slide, it has a, you hit the red button when you're recording, so you put your, you can put an image, or you can do a screencast, but usually I just put the image, and the slide has a red button, Nice and simple, you hit the red button, but you only get 30 seconds for that slide and it will cut you off. And if you wanna re record, you just hit the red button again. And if you need more than 30 seconds on the slide, you can just copy the slide, but I usually will just throw up the, you know, I'll do the PowerPoint, put my notes in the notes section of the slides and I put my slides in of what images. And then that way I know I've not spent more than 30 seconds per slide. And if I just need to recreate or even a year from now, if I just need to replace one section because maybe one section changed, I can just edit that part. And it already has it broken up into that 30 second, and you don't even have to talk for 30 seconds. You could just do 10, 15, 
and it just pushes you through easily. It's got different formats and it, it does all the packaging. You can even add music to the background. It has free music it, and it even, you know, free images. It's for the non-techie who wants to look professional and have something that's a little bit more interesting than just, you know, the normal background with the ahs, the ums, and, you know, the blathering on. Short, sweet, 30 seconds. I love it. Cuts me off. Perfect. <laughs>